Good morning everyone and welcome to worship here at Cromer Four Towns and Points Pass. Uh, there are a number of items of news that you may have noticed. The church has declared the people responsible, legitimately responsible, taking these decisions. And the church have decided that we won't meet uh, in gathered worship until at least the 1st of April. So we are very hopeful that, um, subject of course to decisions by the Kirk Sessions, that we may be able to meet on Easter, which this year falls on the 4th of April. Also, um, the church has issued a rather opaque statement, which, uh, having read it several times, I think says that we approve of people taking the vaccine unless their conscience very strongly advises them not to. Can I personally urge you to take the advice of your medical advisor? If you're offered the vaccine, then unless you have a strong personal objection, I recommend that you take it. Um, there has been bad news in that uh, we have heard that the father of Paddy McKibben, our brother from Four Towns, has died. Um, please hold that family, Paddy and Frida and their children uh, and friends in, in your prayers. We continue to do our uh, daily Bible readings every morning at 11. If you tune in, you should be fit to get a uh, new chapter of Deuteronomy each day this week on our YouTube channel and on our Facebook page. I'm available uh, on 0777 If you want to talk to me about anything, then I am glad to speak to you about it. Our hope is in the name of the Lord, which hath made heaven and earth. Let's come together in prayer. Heavenly Father, we lift up our church before you. We pray that you will be with us as we seek to worship you obediently today. We thank you for the life, the sacrifice, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and for the life which he purchased on the behalf of each one of his people, bringing us not merely forgiveness and redemption, but everlasting life in his presence as one of your children. We pray you'll be with us as we study the scripture. We thank you for it. We thank you for its guidance and for the way in which it guides us in our lives. We pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to us in it, showing us its truth and its relevance to our lives and uh, helping us to live it out uh, over the next seven days as your obedient people. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's come together in some worship. Let's worship together.
we're going to continue looking at these heroes of the Old Testament uh, that we have seen in Hebrews chapter 11. And today we're going to think about Moses. Uh, Moses, of course, the great prophet, uh, the one chosen by God to lead his people out of Egypt and to the very gates of the Promised Land. We're reading in the book of Deuteronomy this week about the addresses that he gave to the people of God uh, drawn up on the plain of Moab immediately before they enter the Promised Land, though he isn't to lead them. He has uh, been punished for his disobedience and lack of faith at one stage during the wanderings in the wilderness um, by not being allowed to lead them into the promised land but he is God's chosen prophet he is the leader of the people he is the lawgiver the one who has received at the hands of God the law and we're going to read from Hebrews chapter 11 verses 23 to 29 I'm reading for the English standard version today which is a good modern version of the Bible if you want such a thing Hebrews 11 verses 23 to 29 this is God's word by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured us seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. By faith the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. Amen. Let's join together in prayer of intercession. Let's intercede before God together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth that you comfort your people. We remember the McKibben family today as they mourn the loss of a very important and loved family member. We pray that you'll be with them and that you will comfort them and that you will strengthen them. We remember all who have been bereaved in these difficult times. We ask that you will likewise be a strength to them. We remember the sick. We remember those who care for and care about the sick. We remember those who are under pressures of all kinds and we pray that you will intervene in each situation according to your perfect will and according to the need of your people. If we lift up our Queen before you, we pray blessing on her. Remember the Duke of Edinburgh as he continues in ill health, the Prince of Wales. We pray for the Prime Minister and the First Minister. We remember the members of the Legislature in Westminster and in Belfast. We pray that those who have been appointed to rule will know both blessing from you and guidance from you. And we pray that you'll be with us as we come to study the scripture, asking these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, a few years ago, I was travelling to Australia. I was travelling to Australia with my family. Uh, my sister was getting married. She had decided that she, she was, my sister lives in Australia. She had decided that she would get married in Australia and the family went out. To her wedding and we were on a sort of cheap airline uh, if such a thing can be said to exist it was a Chinese airline uh, there weren't very many people who were Westerners on the airline we were flying to Shanghai and my children weren't all that especially happy so they were we I took one of them onto my knee and she was crying and crying and I started singing to her as I always have done whenever they were we and whenever they were sad and I sang various songs that my father had sung to me. Um, and then I started singing a song called The Lily Burleros. I'm sure that many of you will know it. Uh, about halfway through singing this song, I looked up and all of the people, well, maybe half of the people in that section of the aircraft had turned around in their seats and were staring at me. You ever been to China? You know, the Chinese are not culturally restrained. When it comes to looking at you, they don't look at you furtive, furtively. If they want to look at you, then they stare at you like this. And maybe half of the people in the plane, that section of the plane who had heard me singing, were looking at me and I was a bit confused by it. And I am culturally conditioned to be embarrassed whenever people look at me like that. So I went. And by the time I looked up, they had looked away. And I couldn't for the life of me understand why they'd looked at me. 
until later I was thinking about it and I thought I was saying the Lily Burleros. Lily Burleros, certainly then, I'm not sure about now, but certainly then, the Lily Burleros was the signature tune of the BBC World Service and they had all heard the instrumental version of Lily Burleros because they would have all had, uh, listened to it as they were learning English, but they may perhaps never have heard the words before and they were looking at me with every scene of interest because I was singing a song that they knew but that they had never perhaps heard sung before. It's a it's a sign to me of the enormous cultural influence that our country has had. And our country has had that enormous cultural influence. It's a matter of debate, of course, but it certainly has had that enormous cultural influence because it has been a successful and a stable country. Our country's democratic constitutional uh, arrangements have been very successful and they in fact are our country's principal political legacy to the world. The benefit of that has spread wide. The United Kingdom, the Irish Republic, the United States of America, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, India. In fact everywhere that there is a parliamentary democracy with a king or a president subject to the law, all of those places live with the political legacy of our country. And of course the Queen is the symbol of continuity and law and representative democracy, of stability and prosperity and security that those arrangements have brought. No matter how stable our institutions, in human affairs permanence is an illusion. But it's continuity, not of human arrangements but of the gift of faith and of God's promises that runs through the bit of Hebrews that we've just read that we're interested in today. This idea of continuity was going to be especially important to the people to whom that letter to the Hebrews was written, because their particular ancient set of institutions were on their last legs. Hebrews didn't know it, but very soon, maybe 35 years after Jesus' death, the Romans were going to flatten not only the temple, but the whole city of Jerusalem, and they were going to scatter Jewish people to the corners of their empire. One of the great messages of this letter to the Hebrews is that in times of disruption, the only continuity is the promise of God and the truth of the gospel. No matter how stable human arrangements are, they will eventually fail, but not so the church. The people of God are part of a great continuity stretching from the beginning at the creation and on into the eternal endless future. What we are to learn in this scripture is that we can place our trust in God in a way that we can't place our trust in any human ruler or any human institution or any human country. Moses is the hero of this part of Hebrews, but the first thing we see in the reflection of his life in Hebrews isn't his work at all. It is the faith of his parents. And we read, By faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. Situation, um, we've read it uh, about six weeks ago in Exodus chapter 1 and 2, at the time when Moses was born, was desperate. The ruler of Egypt, the pharaoh, had commanded midwives to kill any newborn Hebrew boy. They were to be killed immediately after birth. They were to be thrown into the Nile, drowned or left for the crocodiles. Now, the midwives were reluctant because uh, we read in Exodus chapter 1 verse 19, they feared God. But even so, all baby boys born to Hebrew women were in danger of their lives from the moment that were, they were born. It's a bit like that part of the New Testament we read about sometimes at Christmas, where Herod tries to kill Jesus by killing the baby boys of Bethlehem. But like Mary and Joseph, Moses' father Amram and his mother Jochebed were having none of it. They saw their son, they saw that he was beautiful or healthy or good, and they decided that they would trust God for the future, that they would keep Moses safe. We should know, uh, all of us who have been to Sunday school should know the story, Moses was hidden in a basket in the bulrushes and there he was found and adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. Moses' parents trusted God for the future. They did what was right and because of their faith 
Moses would become the leader of God's people who would lead them to freedom. And it reminds us that we never know the things that we do, what they're going to lead to. We never know how important even the smallest thing might be. Saving their son was no small thing, but Abram and Jochebed didn't know the importance to the whole of God's people of what they were doing. And the message is that God has a plan, that he's faithful. When his people obey him, he uses us to fulfil his plan. Our, our job is to be faithful, no matter how rough things might be, or sometimes just as difficult, no matter how good things might become. When we're faithful, then we can trust God to take care of the rest according to his sovereign will. Faith of Moses, parents, allowed the faith of Moses to come into its strength. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now Moses had a privileged upbringing, but he hadn't forgotten who he was. And one day, when he thought no one was looking, he killed an Egyptian who had been brutalizing one of his fellow Hebrews. But someone had been looking. And Moses went in the run to the land of Midian before Pharaoh was able to catch up with him. Now Midian was a fair way away. It was on the Arabian side of the Red Sea. If you imagine the Red Sea, it looks a bit like a rabbit. Midian was to the right hand of the right hand rabbit's ear. Moses chose to abandon security, he chose to abandon safety, he chose to abandon wealth and privilege and influence and to suffer with his own people. You notice if you're reading this along, you notice the odd turn of phrase here. He considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than all the treasures of Egypt. It's odd because Moses never heard the name of Christ. What the writer is doing here, I think, is to identify Jesus with God's people. Jesus was the perfect Israelite. He was the fulfilment of what Moses was chosen to begin. Moses unknowingly chose to be reproached along with Christ when he chose to share the sufferings of his people. Now this letter was written to a church that was persecuted. It was written to a people who were going to face even more disruption than they had ever known before. God prepared them for faithfulness in a time when they would be, comp they would be tempted to compromise with the world for the sake of peace and faith safety. Look at Moses, he tells them. He faced that choice. Be as faithful as Moses, they're told. Be faithful and trust God for the future. Moses' faith was essential to the future of God's people. He found a wife during his exile in Midian, a woman called Zipporah, whose father was called Jethro, the priest of Midian, obviously a man of wealth and influence. One day, while out minding his father-in-law's sheep, Moses encountered the angel of the Lord and he was brought to meet God directly at the burning bush, the very thing that we Presbyterians take as our symbol. Moses was told to bring God's people out of captivity and he was given the ability to perform signs so that the people he was negotiating with would know that he was sent by God. And that, by the way, is the same reason why the apostles were given the ability to perform miracles in the New Testament. Before the Bible was fully written and completed, it was the way that people were marked as being sent by God. Moses' faith led to his leadership of his people, and what we see is that Moses' faith strengthened the faith of the Hebrew church. By faith, we read, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, so that the destroyer of firstborn might not touch them. By faith, the people crossed the Red Sea as on dry land, but the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. Between Moses' return from Midian and the departure of the children of Israel from Egypt, Moses negotiated with Pharaoh. He wasn't negotiating alone. He was backed up by increasingly terrible plagues, ending with the death, death of the firstborn in every family, which was not protected by the blood of the lamb over their doorposts. It must have seemed a poor thing to protect their children by, but the Hebrews trusted God. They sprinkled the blood in faith and they found that their trust was repaid by God's protection. Hebrews were allowed to go. 
But then Pharaoh changed his mind, and he chased them. The Red Sea parted the path for freedom lay through the parting, and the children of Israel had a choice, turn back or go on. Led by Moses, they went off into the unknown. They obeyed God. They set out through the parted sea. These episodes from Moses' life teach us about faith and about God. They teach us that God keeps his promises. Moses' parents trusted God to keep their child safe. Moses cho chose to be faithful to God and to his people, preferring persecution to compromise and luxury. As a result, he was used by God to free his people and to lead them in obedience into the unknown. What we see here is continuity in faith and God's faithfulness to his people. We're reminded that God's whole scheme of salvation, his plan to save his people led before the foundation of the world, lay at the end of the journey started here by Moses and the Hebrews. Moses considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. Christ is the fulfilment of the promises made by God to Abraham and to Moses thousands of years before in the deep past. They trusted God. God proved their trust and their faith was well founded. And we're to learn this lesson. God has kept his promises in the past. He sent Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, to die on the cross so that the promises he made to his people would be kept so that those who come to him through Christ can be saved. God keeps all his promises to us no matter how bad things might seem, no matter how much we are tempted to conform in return for prosperity or security or respectability. The faith of Moses' parents in the face of adversity led to the faith of Moses in adversity, led to the faithfulness of God's people in adversity, which led to escape and freedom and eventually increased to salvation for all who come through God or through Christ and eventually increased to salvation for all who come to the Father through him. People in the past faced the same choices that we do. They chose to be faithful. They were rewarded for their faithfulness. The same is true for us. The people of God are part of a great continuity, stretching from the creation and on into the eternal future. We can place our trust in God full of confidence in his faithfulness and in his promises. Amen. Let's come together in some worship. Let's sing together. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.